That's what I'm here this morning to talk to you about. How to be invaluable. Because when you take others to the next level, you get there too. When I was 21 years old, I met my first athletic coach, Tom. He turned my life around. Decades later, I called Tom and I asked him what I did that made me different. What did I do that allowed me to play in the NBA for 12 years? And what he told me had an explosive impact on my life. Today, as a team building coach and expert, I teach the things that he shared with me that day. The things that I did that made me invaluable to my team. This morning, you will learn what it takes to get in the game and stay there. No matter where you are today, even in areas that you failed in the past. I'm going to teach you how to be invaluable to your team. And consistently play at the top of your game. In fact, I'd like you to think of today, May 4th, right? Fifth, thank you. May 5th, as the day that I became your coach. Because on this day, you discovered the four secrets that completely turned your career and organization around. This morning, I intend to become that coach for you. And it's not just my intention, it's my expectation, nothing less. It's April 1977. I'm 21 years old. A man walks into the tire store where I'm working as an auto mechanic, and he asks me the one question I hate. Do you play basketball? <laughs> basketball was the one thing I decided I would never do again. Now, most of you probably believe that if you're tall, you can be great at basketball. Well, in high school, the coach only put me in a game one time. And three seconds after I got on the court, the game ended. <laughs> I was that bad. In fact, here's the only action shot I could find from my high school career. <laughs> Just stand there. As a senior in high school, the small guys on my team were a lot faster than I was. I couldn't keep up. Now, if you're tall, there are some things you can be great at on a basketball court, but unfortunately, I didn't know what they were, and neither did my coach. I hated basketball, and I wanted to forget about it. But you see, that was impossible. A day didn't go by without absolute strangers asking me, do you play basketball? <laughs> now, I just wanted to be like everyone else. But kids called me a freak. They called me Lurch. <laughs> they tried to beat me up. I was like some kind of a tree they wanted to topple. I didn't go to supermarkets because people stalked me in every aisle. The pointing, staring, and comments kept me out of shopping malls. I avoided people. But it wasn't just people I was avoiding. I was running away from failure. I had failed at the one thing everyone believed I could do. So after high school, I said goodbye to basketball and became an auto mechanic. But that question still remained. So this man is standing here in my tire store asking me the question I didn't want to answer. This morning you'll understand why. You'll hear the story of how I went from a 21-year-old auto mechanic who couldn't play basketball to an NBA <laughs> who played for the Utah Jazz for 12 years when the average is three. And you'll understand why I was never traded and why, when I retired, I received the honor that my jersey, number 53, will never be worn by another player again. When I called my coach, Tom, and I asked him what I did that made me a great team player, he said, Mark, you did four things. 
They're four of the most powerful principles you may ever hear. They're the four things that took me from someone with no talent or passion for the game of basketball to the top of the biggest game out there. And they're the same things that took our team, the Utah Jazz, to the top of the charts. I'm going to teach you how to apply these principles today because I want to help you create teams and clubs that are unstoppable, united forces. And get the spirit and discipline you need to dominate your game. I want to teach you how to create that kind of teamwork. The kind that creates champions. See, in the world of professional sports, if you don't have teamwork, you're out of the game. It's not a luxury. It's what you do. Have you ever worked in an organization where there's a lot of infighting, backstabbing, office politics? How'd that affect your productivity and profitability? What would it be like if you went back to work on Monday and there was no internal competition? None. Can you even imagine that? That's what it's like when you walk out on the court and you're playing a world-class NBA basketball game. That's what we're here today to achieve. If you want to win today and go sky high, you need to end the internal competition. On a sports team where everyone is playing for themselves, that spells failure immediately. In business, it's just a matter of time. Without teamwork, people don't truly collaborate or cooperate. Now, there's a lot of confusion about how to create teamwork. Sports teams are not confused. We know what we have to do. And when you walk out of here, you're going to know what you have to do, too, because that's what I teach, what I learned in my 12 years in the NBA. So how do you create a winning team? Well, we've heard the best way to create a winning team is you get the very best players and put them on the right seat of the bus. <laughs> well, that's not what happened to the 2004 U.S. Olympic basketball team. The very best players were handpicked for that team, all playing the positions where they excelled, and they lost. An Olympic basketball team lost for the first time since 1988. What went wrong? Didn't they want to win? Something was missing. What was that? The one thing that separates a group from a team. Every winning team knows, knows the answer to this, or they don't last. So what is the secret? What makes a group of people a team? A group of people sharing a common goal, a leader, an ideal, or have some sort of shared experience. What is a team? A team is a group of people who are committed to each other. So the important question is, what are the commitments that make a team win and an individual a great team player? I'm going to tell you what separates the winners from the losers. Most people are not clear about how teamwork is created. Athletic teams are. You're going to get them here in this room today, and you're going to be able to use these principles the moment you step out the door. And I believe if you do, nothing short of miracles will happen. See, I didn't make it to the NBA just because I was tall. There's a lot of tall guys that don't make it. And I was 21. That's old to get started playing basketball. I started late, but I made it to the top. And I believe if I could do it, anyone can. Because I believe each of you in here has a gift, something that makes you truly unique. And today I'm going to show you how that gift can be a true and lasting value to others. So back to my tire store. Well, it turns out this man, his name is Tom Lubin, and he's an assistant basketball coach at the local junior college. I tell him, no, I don't play basketball. End of conversation. <laughs> and I think that's the last I'll see him. Well, he doesn't take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. The next day he comes back. Claims he has a rattle under his hood. He wants me to go for a ride around the block with him. <laughs> I get in the car, I'm listening for a rattle. He's talking basketball. I said, buddy, take me back to the shop and let me out of, out of the car. 
Two days later, he comes back. He's got a college catalog. He wants to talk to me about enrolling at Cypress Junior College, where he's the assistant coach. I said, you know what? I had enough youth coaches in high school. I'm really not interested. And I took that college catalog, opened the bottom drawer of my toolbox, dropped it in there, and kicked the clothes. <laughs> Wednesday morning, 10 o'clock, he's back again. <laughs> comes walking in my shop with a box. Inside the box is a pair of basketball shoes. Size 17. I don't know what to do with these shoes. Thursday afternoon, he's back again. Comes in my shop with another assistant coach. This coach just walks in my shop, stands there and stares at me like this. <laughs> they proceed to follow me around the car, working on for 30 minutes. Tom yakking away about all the players that he's helped that have gone on to play collegiate and professional basketball. The other coach never says a word. <laughs> After a half an hour of this, I said, listen guys, I don't know who any of those players are, and I really don't care. I said, I had enough of you coaches in high school, I know there is no place for me in a basketball team, basketball team, and it's time for me to get back to work. Well, the next day he's back. <laughs> With Swim. One of the players he helped get in the NBA. Swen assures me that Tom is the man that can teach me everything I need to know about the game of basketball, and we should go to lunch and talk about it. I said, you know what, that's great, Swen. You're a basketball player. I'm a mechanic. No, thanks. It's now visit nine. <laughs> Tom comes in my shop, tells me everything that he's learned from his great uncle, who taught him how to play basketball, everything he learned as a coach, everything he wants to teach me, and that we need to get started doing these things today. This man came back in my shop 15 times. I felt like the first tire bus without a stalker. <laughs> Finally, after the 15th visit, he said, listen, Mark, he said, if you'll go out on the basketball court with me for 30 minutes, and allow me to show you what I can teach you about the game. If you don't like what you see, I promise I'll leave you alone. And I said, Tom, if that's what it takes to get you out of my shop so I can go back to work, I'll be there. So the next morning, we went out to Cypress College. We couldn't even get in the gym. We were just out on the blacktop. And Tom started showing me things I had never seen before. Basketball moves specifically designed for tall guys. Things like catch the ball, take a step, hook shot, catch the ball, pivot, bank shot. And as simple as those things are, they had never existed in my world of basketball. High school basketball is all about these short little guys running around really quick. <laughs> and I'd never considered what a big guy could do on the floor. Well, I learned a couple of things that day. The first thing I learned is that if there's something that's different about you that makes you uncomfortable, it may be your greatest asset. Tom showed me how my height, which I consider to be a liability, could actually be my greatest strength. That day I learned that if enough people are telling you how to do something, perhaps it's a good idea to listen. That day, I had to let go of every idea about who or what I could be. That day, I had a new answer to the question, do you play basketball? Now, it took him almost two months to convince me to go out on the basketball court and give this a try for 30 minutes. But there was something inside of me that said, hmm, maybe I ought to take a look at this one more time. Do you ever have a feeling like that? Like maybe there's something you ought to consider once more? Now, I had no idea what I was about to embark on, but I had someone who was willing to stand alongside of me and show me exactly what I needed to do. Tom was the first person to come along in my life who believed I could make it to the next level. Now, I'd done nothing athletic for over three years, partied, and ate junk food. I began to change. One day, Swan shows up at my door, takes me to the health food store, introduces me to protein powder, alfalfa pills, desiccated liver. <laughs> Tom lent me a pair of workout shorts. I didn't even own a pair. Tom would come to my apartment at 6 o'clock in the morning and wake me up. 
and we'd run for an hour before I went to work. Then after work, we'd go in the gym for two hours. We spent a half an hour on footwork, a half an hour on agility drills, a half an hour in the weight room, and a half an hour just learning how to catch and shoot the basketball. Because you see, my knees were so stiff from standing on concrete floors, my hands were so tight from holding wrenches that we literally had to start with, this is how you bend your knees, this is how you open your hand, this is how you catch the basketball. My day started at 6.30 in the morning and ended at 10.30 at night. For the first few weeks, I didn't think I was making any progress. It took every ounce of energy I could muster just to get out of bed in the morning. But after a few more weeks, things started to come together. My muscles weren't quite as sore, my feet started working a little bit better, and I was able to catch the ball a bit easier. After four months of doing this, I said, all right, I'll give this a try for one year. And I committed myself. And I took out that college catalog out of the bottom row of my toolbox, and I signed up for junior college. Now let's think about this for a minute. If you were going to design a plan of how to become an NBA basketball player, do you think it would include quitting basketball after high school, moving to Arizona to go to trade school for a year to be a, learn to be an auto mechanic, moving back to Southern California, getting fired from your first job so that you could move across town to a tired auto center where at the exact right moment you, you come out of the bay that you're working on, down to the corner of this busy intersection to greet a customer so that a coach had worked with a couple of NBA players, might drive by, see you there, come in and offer you a chance to play basketball. <laughs> I mean, it's a bit of a miracle, isn't it? And the crazy part was, it was a miracle I didn't want to be a part of. <laughs> so I enrolled at Cypress Junior College. I kept my job in the morning. I went to practice in the afternoon. And I, I went to night school there, where Tom was the assistant coach. It was my first chance to play basketball on a team. Now, luckily for me, the, the day before the first game, the starting center broke his nose. Ironically, it was on my elbow. <laughs> That's how I became the starting center the of the Chargers. <laughs> now the first year went pretty well. I was able to get a little bit of playing time, got a little bit more self-confidence. And by the end of that first year, it had enough experience and enough success that I decided, all right, it's time to get, uh, it's time to get done with this uh, being a mechanic thing and, and get serious about this game of basketball. Because it was too hard being a bent over the hood of a car all morning and then trying to play basketball in the afternoon. So I quit my job as a mechanic, and I got a job selling cars. Dotsons. <laughs> Perhaps you can picture me behind the wheel of a DC 1090, explaining to the customer this is actually a booming vehicle. <laughs> well, the second year went even better. We won the state championship of California. And now it was time to decide where to go to the big school. I played well, I was seven foot four, and I got a lot of attention. Six to eight college coaches a day showed up outside my apartment, outside the gymnasium, outside my classroom, all wanted me to play for their college or university. It was kind of like being stalked all over again. This time. <laughs> and finally, after much consideration, I decided to go to UCLA. They were one of the biggest names in college basketball. And I decided to go there for two reasons. Number one, the head coach, Larry Brown, who both played in the NBA and coached in the NBA. And number two, I had this vision of me being on national television every Saturday afternoon with all the NBA scouts watching me play. So I became a member of the UCLA Bruins. It was the big time, and everything changed. You see, they just had this very successful season the year before I got there. And the coach really wasn't interested in changing anything to include me. I found myself sitting on the end of the bench again. The assistant coach who recruited me was still excited about me. The head coach really wasn't. So I watched my teammates from the sidelines. If I was lucky, I got to play three minutes a game. In fact, that year, I watched our team go from number two in the country to number 62. 
I knew I could help, but I wasn't given a chance. At the end of that year, I thought my college career had already been a complete failure. I thought, maybe I just don't have what it takes. And every afternoon that summer, I would go and work out at the men's gym at UCLA. Now, the men's gym at UCLA was the site of some of the greatest pickup games or practice games every afternoon. All the greatest players in Los Angeles would congregate there to test their skills against one another. Magic Johnson was there, Kareem, James Worthy, Michael Cooper, all these great Laker players. And every afternoon, I played in these games. They were like NBA All-Star games. Only the best players could join in. And one afternoon in particular, let's say one basket back here and one basket down there, I'm trying to catch this little guard on our team named Rocket Rod Foster. <laughs> Simply the fastest human being I've ever seen from one end of the court to the other. And he's getting to the basket about the time I'm going across <laughs> half court. <laughs> I can't get this figured out. I'm out on the court, but I'm, I'm not in the game. And I'm frustrated, and I'm standing over on the sidelines for a minute, taking a break, and I'm huffing and puffing and holding my shorts, and just thinking, man, I don't know if I can do this. And at that moment, I feel this large hand on my shoulder. And I turn around. It's Will Chamberlain. <laughs> Arguably the greatest basketball player that ever lived. Will had retired from the NBA a few years earlier, and every afternoon would come down and watch the young guys work out. Will grabbed me by the shoulder, spun me around, looked me, he said, looked me in the eye, and he said, first of all, young fella, you are never going to catch that man. <laughs> so thanks, Will, I already figured that out. And he said, more importantly, it's not your job. Will grabbed me by the arm, position, took me out on the floor, positioned me right in front of the basket. He said, you see this basket? He said, your job is to stop players from getting there. Your job is to make them miss their shot, collect the rebound, throw it up to the guard, let them go down the other end and score it, and your job is to cruise up to half court and see what's going on. <laughs> I like this part. <laughs> he said, I've been watching you play for the past three or four days, and I see the skill you have at defense. He said, this is what you need to concentrate on. When Will shared that with me, everything changed. I understood what I needed to do. I understood what I could be great at. Will showed me what my job was and how doing what I did would benefit my team. In that moment, I knew what I needed to focus on and what I needed to let go of. I wasn't that fast. I wasn't that good at scoring. But I did have a talent for preventing others from scoring goals. And it took a Will Chamberlain to see it. I stopped running around trying to do everything and instead focused on the one thing I could be great at. And I went on to become one of the great defensive players in the NBA. Four years later, that five-minute conversation took me to breaking the NBA record for the most blocked shots in the single season, 456, which is still the record today. That five-minute conversation took me to a 12-year NBA career, being named Defensive Player of the Year twice, and in 1989, I was named an all-star. Commitment number one of a winning team is know your job. How many of you are running around trying to do everything when there's really only one thing you can be great at? And if you're not doing that one thing, you're probably not succeeding. How many of us are guilty of this? We get so focused on exceeding expectations that we forget the basics. To position yourself for success today, you need to narrow your focus and intensify it. To play at the top of your game, do what you do best. That's your job. Mm -hmm. What are you excellent at? What is your greatest strength? We're going to do a quick little 30-second exercise here, and I want you to tell the partner the answer to these two questions. And I have a list of these. 
What is your greatest character trait? That's who you are when you wake up in the morning. And what is your greatest skill? Most valuable skill? Here's a list to give you a couple of ideas. But I'd like to just take 30 seconds each and tell the person next to you the answer to those two questions. What's my greatest character trait? And what is my greatest skill? Okay, go. Yeah, hard working. Character. Character. My greatest character. Alright, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Somebody else has to tell me mine. Uh, try and solve the thing. Probably have to be um, yeah, honesty too. More integrity. It's hard to say it for yourself. I think other people have to kind of tell you what your best one is. Loyalty, yeah. That I am too. Yeah. Okay. Back up here. I like inventing. The purpose of this exercise is to get you to consider to play to your strengths. Because when you learn to play to your strengths, you learn to honor your role. And when you learn to honor your role on a team, you allow others to honor theirs. And when everyone focuses on what they do best, you have a good foundation. Well, Wilt had given me the first key. I had the first commitment. Know your job. But there were still three more things I needed to learn. I didn't play much at UCLA, but I made a decision that I wasn't going to quit. Because I had to know if I could play basketball or not. And even if I finished my collegiate career and didn't make it as a pro, at least I wanted to be able to say, yes, I played basketball. What kept me going was what my coach, Tom, had told me from the beginning. He said, Mark, this is going to be a journey of ups and downs. And he said, not all coaches you encounter will understand what a big guy can do. When I called my coach and asked him why I wasn't playing at UCLA, he said, Mark, it's not the coach. It's not the team. It's you. You need to get better. He said, if you're not going to play in the games, you're going to have to make your practices your games. You're going to have to be the first guy there and the last to leave. You're going to have to continue to do your running, do your shooting, and hit the weight room. Because if you continue to work out, I promise you, you will have an opportunity to try out for an NBA team. Now, I had no reason to believe him. There was no success around me as far as I could see. But I put my faith in him because I believed he could see a little bit further than I could. He gave me a game plan, and I followed it. I did what I was asked to do. And that's commitment number two. Do what you're asked to do. In basketball, we call this executing the play. Are we clear about what others want from us? Do we really know what's expected of us? Do we ask, or are we hoping? I knew I wasn't playing at UCLA, and I, I didn't know why. Most of us think if we find another situation, <laughs> things will improve. Well, nine times out of ten, it's not the situation. It's not what's out there that's a problem. It's us. I made it to the top because I was out on the court all those days doing what I'd been asked to do. If you want to go from good to great, if you want to go from doing your best to being the best, you need to do what you've been asked to do. It may not be easy. It may take more discipline and more effort than you believe you can put out. If you want to be a champion, there is a path. Execute the play. That's a success secret no one has told you. You don't hear that one in the world today. That's what got me into the NBA. 
When Tom asked me to work out six hours a day, five days a week, I worked out six hours a day, five days a week. I did exactly what he asked me to do. Not less, not something like it. Your job is to do what you've been asked to do, not to do your best, not to do what you think is best. Do what you've been asked. In our culture of individualists, you'll stand out if you just do that. In today's world, that is exceeding expectations. What if you ask your spouse what you should do differently? <laughs> Come and get a list. <laughs> what if you did that list? You blow them away. Tom told me if I stopped practicing, it was all over. So I practiced. I really practiced. It was my senior year, and I was willing to do anything I could to have a chance to play in the NBA. Every morning I got up and I went to the gym at 9 o'clock. And I spent an hour and a half shooting the basketball from every position on the court. Then I went in the weight room. Then I went out on the track and I did sprints and laps. I worked out and I got stronger. Most guys were out there for an hour or two. I was out there six hours a day trying to get better. So why aren't we asking what it is we should be doing? Well, I think the first reason we don't ask is we're afraid it might look like we don't know what we're doing. So how can we ask and get the answer we need and still look good? We need to ask skillfully. We need to communicate our game plan and then ask if there's anything else that we should be doing. If there's anything else that we should be more focused on. There's another reason we don't ask. We don't want more work. <laughs> We're afraid we'll be asked to work longer and harder. We're afraid that if we ask, we'll be expected to deliver. And that's true. In fact, my coach did ask me to work out longer and harder. Being out on the court six hours a day got me in the game I needed to be in. If you want to play a bigger game, you may be asked to do more than you ever thought you could. You may be asked to do things you haven't done before. Doing them is what's going to get you on the court. See, we're afraid we're going to hear things that are unreasonable. Unless it violates your integrity, doing what's unreasonable is exactly and ultimately what will make you outstanding. We're all afraid we're going to hear things that are impossible, things we assume we can't do, things that we don't want to do, and very likely we will. And that's where the goal is, making the impossible possible. Fulfilling the unrealistic request is what separates the champions from the rest, the winners from everyone else. Having the courage to ask and the discipline to commit is what will make you outstanding. And doing precisely what you've been asked is remarkable. These things will take you from useful to invaluable and from ordinary to extraordinary. So here's a question to consider. What do your people, the members of your club, or the customers you work with really want from you? When did you last ask? On a scale of 1 to 10, how clear are you about their priorities, not yours? 10, you're clear. 1, you have no idea. Well, now it's time to try out for the NBA. But I had a bit of a problem. No one knew who I was. Remember that vision of me being on national television? The cameras didn't quite catch me at the end of the bench. <laughs> So my coach Tom and I, we created our own NBA marketing campaign. We got out the NBA statistics and we looked up all the worst teams in the NBA. The Utah Jazz were right at the bottom. <laughs> the very last in almost every statistical category. We called them on the phone. We thought, you know, maybe they'd give me a chance. The coach and general manager, Brooklyn-born Frank Layden, answered the phone. The marketing never heard of Send me a tape. We did. Years later, he claimed all he received was 30 minutes of me taking on and off my warm ups from UCLA. <laughs> but Frank came out and watched me play in the summer league in Southern California. He pulled me aside and he said, Son, I can tell you've been working. 
He said, I'll make you a deal. He said, you come to our training camp a month early before all the other players and coaches get there. You work with, with our coaches. You get on our running program. You get on our weight training program. And I'll give you a chance to play for one year. I said, Coach, that's all I'm looking for is a chance. So I showed up in Salt Lake City in September 1982. I thought I was in pretty good shape. <laughs> I wasn't even close. So I did what Frank asked me to do. And by February 1st, I was on my game, and I was the starting center of the Utah Jazz. Now, Frank was gambling. He had to. He had to do something. The Jazz were losing money, and they were losing games. They had never had a winning season. Frank had become their coach just a few months earlier. In fact, we used to give away posters of other team's players to get people to come to the arena. <laughs> the old joke was someone would say, hey, coach, what time's the game tonight? He'd say, well, uh, what time could you be there? <laughs> Frank started to try and pull us together. He said, if you guys will stop competing with each other and start cooperating with each other, the individual accolades will follow. Frank was taking a chance on a lot of guys that had worn out their welcomes on other teams and players like myself that had little or, no or little or no experience. We needed good coaching. We needed to understand what it meant to be a team. Frank told us, no one cares if you're scoring a lot of points on a losing team. Everyone wants the players from a winning team. We listen and went from a group of obscure players to players that many of you have heard of today. We stopped competing with each other. We started cooperating with each other. We started passing the ball. We started making each other look good, and in time, we started to look good as a team. And as Frank said, the individual accolades came rolling in. What Frank was talking about, what made me great, was that I never hesitated to pass the ball when someone else had a better chance of scoring. I made my teammates look great. That's commitment number three. Make people look good. One of the most important keys to success is to provide other people with recognition. Making people look good makes you look good. The better you make others look, the better you look to them. In basketball, if there's a player who doesn't pass the ball when it's in the best interest of the team, we call him the black hole. That's the person you throw the ball to, and it never comes back. <laughs> Nothing will alienate your teammates faster than hogging the ball. Nothing will make you outstanding faster than passing the ball. This is my teammate, John Stockton. Many of you have heard of him. This picture was taken at the basketball hall.